It is Sunday morning. Happy Thanksgiving weekend. This is the Dad and Rock After Show. This is Sean. And this is Chris. And uh, we are here once again to discuss the latest and greatest in the week in TV and streaming, um, as well as some of the uh, the news that dropped a uh, big shakeup over at Disney this week. That was Something huge, dude. About. I didn't see yeah. that coming. But before yeah. we get into that, who are we and what do we do? Uh, we're Dad and Rock. We come here each week to do this thing, uh, the Dad and Rock After Show, where we uh, talk about uh, shows like this week we are talking, and we have been for the last, you know, uh, quite a few weeks, but Star Wars Andor and the peripheral on Amazon Prime. And uh, as we go through here, this was Andor's last week, and I think Willow is starting up next week. We'll be There we go. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll roll right into Willow next week. Yeah, we also do like trailer uh, trailer reviews and trailer uh, reactions on the channel too, and some other fun you know fun stuff. So if you haven't liked and subscribed to our page just yet on YouTube, be sure to go ahead and do that. Yeah, there we go. So we've had to. I mean, I if you guys have been following us, I've become a big Disney parks person over the last eighteen months, two years. Uh, when I went with my family for the first time, it was during the pandemic. It was right when they reopened. A lot of things weren't available, and when I left, I was. I told my wife, I said, we are in danger of being Disney people. You just got and, back from it again last week. And a week and a half ago, I just got back. I went down there. Okay, it's gotten so bad that now we go without our kids. We <laughs> leave the kids home and we go down, which was a fantastic experience. But we found out we're not as young as we used to be. Sure. And I think we were actually more tired this trip than we were with the kids. Because with the kids, we paced the kids. And when the kids got tired, we pulled the plug. Right. With this, we went as we went all day it was yeah. like we just went so we got it we were wiped out yeah but the reason we bring all this up is bob Iger used to run the company pre-pandemic he ran the company he's the one that was responsible for you know you're know, bringing fox in you know pixar star wars all these yeah. big things that he came in and he decided it was time to step down it was time to go away and this, i think it's all this decision was made pre-pandemic and they picked bob chapek to go ahead and take over yeah, who at the time was over the parks himself. Yes, right? he was just there. And the thing is, people didn't like him over the parks. Like the Disney that. people yeah. did not have a glowing, you know, opinion right. above him or about the yeah. parks. He thought they were, he was killing the parks. Yeah. So when they put him in the place, people already were like, oh, I don't know about this. But but Chapek, uh, Iger was like, you know, he was the guy Chapek picked. Or I, yeah. Iger picked Chapek. Right. To yeah. Succeed him. And after not even, I think, a year into the whole thing, those two didn't even talk anymore because right. Iger didn't like what he was doing. It became a big shit sandwich. And, man, it went it went bad quickly. I remember reports of disagreements when Iger was even still there where he was doing the transition phase and mm -hmm. he was still kind of, had kind of a role there and was like. Yeah, he was the head Jpeg of the board. Up. Yeah. yeah. He, JPEG took over at, as a CEO, but Iger was still the head of the board. So he still right. had say in things to kind of and help that transition. I think Chapek like um, created brand new positions uh, because uh, uh, Iger was very hands-on where he would have direct meetings yeah. with the heads of the studios, you know, with your Kathleen Kennedy and with your Feige and stuff like he would, um, you know, he would have direct meetings and it was a very close relationship um, that he would have, but I think JPEG like installed a bunch of middlemen in between them. Yeah, and he him. removed all of the creative power yeah. away from the creatives. Right. So he took Kathleen Kennedy out. Of, she no longer had the final say. Faye no longer had the final say. He basically buried Pixar. Pixar was nothing but a streaming movie the uh, you know service now. Yeah, and I mean, think there was Soul. What turning red um and i know onward that, onwards another one onward was yeah that was the first cash yeah that that kind yeah. of that got a little bit of a theatrical release it was one of those ones that right. was at the very beginning just on the edge yeah it depended on where in the region you were at if you got that in the theater or not but most people right. got that free but he also tried the paid service like the premium disney plus yeah for like a, what was it mulan was one it was raya and the last dragon another one that was another one i think yeah that where was paid basically paid uh, the same amount of money that you would have paid, well, even more so if you were to like buy the movie once it comes out digitally, it was like thirty bucks or something extra. Yeah, on it was top something that I I never did. I was like, I I'm, I'm not I doing this. There's no yeah. there's no way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of questionable decisions, and the entire time over his tenure, Chapek's tenure there, there was just grumbling. Oh, the thing with uh, Scarlett Johansson. 
Yeah, that was that was huge in the news, and it just made Disney look bad. Disney even I remember Disney even put out this petty like um, press release statement into the press that week too, when this was all going down with her, where they were like, "Well, we're very sorry that she's so dissatisfied with the millions that we've paid her." It was something very snarky and crappy yeah. like that. It was just not a good look for a company like Disney, you know. And yet, it was all coming from above. I yeah. mean, like, JPEG was basically you know sicking the dragons on I me. Mean, he put this. I wouldn't even know completely aware, but he had a whole like middle management team set up right. that decided where everything went, who had no, no experience in the entertainment business whatsoever. They were all like his, his buddies, his bank money making and, people. And yeah, yeah, all these people there. And they decided, you know, this goes here, this goes there and go figure nothing was working. Right. And then there's so many people upset about like at the parks themselves, the park right now, since the pandemic, they've got a thing called the park reservation system. Uh -huh. So you get your go ahead and you get your ticket and everything, but you need a park reservation as well to be able to get in. So say, for yeah. instance, I stay at a, an actual uh, hotel on Disney property. I also have to make a reservation for the day I want to be in the park at what park I want to be at. Mm, okay. And then the park hopping, which used to be you can do whatever at any point, didn't start until two o'clock. Now, a lot of this is because of COVID, because of wanting to keep the, you know, the crowds down, managing the crowds and everything. And I never had an issue with it. Frankly, I look at it this way. If you're going to Disney, there's preparation you need to do. Mm -hmm. It's not something you can just do on a whim anyway. You have to yeah. do your dining. You got to do your hotel. You have to do. There's so much that goes into it. It's freaking overwhelming, frankly. Yeah. But. They're like, oh, we hate the fact that we got to make a reservation to go to a park. Uh, this and that. I'm like, it takes 10 seconds. Right. And I always looked at it when I first went. And, and also the Genie Plus. Now, this is the thing that I, I, I really have an issue with Disney people that prior to me. Because Genie Plus basically is an app that helps you know when you have availability on rides, what the wait times are. Uh, they got rid of Fast Pass, And now you have to pay for it through Genie Plus. Okay. And people are upset about that. Why Why you make me pay for something that was free before? Right. Well, every other company, every other company, theme park company, you have to pay to be able to skip the line. Right. So Disney, in theory, spoiled their group. They went ahead yeah. and all their fans that they've been giving free stuff to for so long, they're like, I don't want to pay for this. Well, I'm like, so wait in line. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's my opinion wait in line. there's millions of other people that will pay for it so yeah. sorry pal so i mean i went ahead and paid for it now the app can be clunky if you don't know what you're doing it falls into that all there is preparation that needs to be done yeah before you go to the park and in my family janessa my wife she gets us there she does all the prep all the travel arrangements everything and then once we're there I'm the one that controls food. I'm the one that controls which rides we're going to, all of that stuff. Because I've done my work and my homework. I've looked into it. I watched enough videos. I read enough about it. This is how you do it. This is when you start doing it. Like you can book your first pass at like 7 a.m. for the park you're going to mm -hmm. for your ride, and then you just go from there. And then there's some rides you can you can pay a little extra to jump the line uh, because of. Uh, like rise of resistance used to have there's a but it dude it, it's a big thing if you really want to know what's going on guys just go ahead and kind of youtube disney plus uh the disney genie plus and yeah. you'll see more about it i mean they, we, we could talk a whole hour about this frankly i mean do you think I, well you could talk a whole lot of them <laughs> i'll yeah. just sit here and listen <laughs> uh what do you think about, i mean are there going to be issues with the park going forward do you think there's going to be big changes uh because a lot of the news is around the entertainment portion of it disney yeah. plus and the content uh, what do you think? Uh, what kind of changes do you think will be made to the parks, if any? I think the reservation system may go to the wayside. Yeah. Uh, and park hopping; those two may go away. What people people nowadays have a short term memory. They don't realize or don't want to realize that Genie Plus is a Bob Iger project. This yeah. has been in the works before JPEG took over. Right. So this Genie Plus is paying for the extra stuff and needing, you know, to use that throughout the day. That's going nowhere. Mm -hmm. 
that I think, in my opinion, and only being there since the whole pandemic happened and all these things were put in place, I like the product. I think it makes my day easy. Between ordering food, knowing which rides have an hour wait, which ones only have 15 minute wait, where I can, you know, divert my day. Yeah. Uh, it also has a way of, of doing it for you, suggesting things. So if you do your homework and you know what you're doing with the app, it's going to be easy. If you try to wing it and you don't know what's going on, it's going to be a headache. I think on the content side of things, um, there's a lot of talk about them getting rid of uh, Kathleen Kennedy. She's such she's hated by Star Wars fanboys, uh, at least a very vocal uh, minority of fanboys out there. That's yeah. Um, that uh, have been throwing hate pretty much since the the sequel trilogy. I mean, since Last Jedi, honestly. Um, but uh, there's a lot of talks about that. I don't think she's going anywhere until after uh, Indiana Jones, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I think that's going to be her. That they're going to do a release Indiana Jones, and then yeah. there's going to be a mutual parting of ways right. between the two. Because I think I think. Iger likes her. I think her and Iger are, are yes. really tight. And plus, when you have a major shakeup like this, the last thing you want to do is just like just come in and start chopping off heads, you know, like of the major first, studio portions of it. Yeah. Yeah. With that, por- especially with the creatives, because it's the all the creatives like the Feige's and the Kennedy's that have been like kind of uh, I don't know. It's debatable if you call Kennedy a creative. She's more of a just a kind of money producer person. But uh, what I'm saying is like they've been kind of on the back burner this whole time. So it's like, it doesn't make a ton of sense to get rid of them immediately. Um, I mean, there is argument as far as like how star Wars franchise has been handled thus far with some of the stuff that's considered a flop. Um, but even like book of Boba and Obi-Wan, which people are kind of hot or cold on. Um, they're still like, you know, the numbers were huge. Them. Yeah. The numbers were huge for them. Um, it would be nice to see Star Wars in the movie theaters again, but maybe that's the, something that'll come out of this. I may um, be. Oh, in the, and, oh, go ahead. I see. I may be in the minority here. I don't would. I would not be disappointed if they cut off Star Wars projects as a whole for like five years. Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, you can't let a you know, a studio and a money maker sit like that. But if they gave us nothing on Disney Plus, they gave us nothing in the theater, nothing animated, and just made us hungry for it again. Because we're we're at a point now where we expect Star Wars content. There was a well, how long of a period was there between, you know, the was it Return of Jedi and then Episode One? Yeah. And when that came out, everyone was so pumped and so excited for it yeah. because it was a new Star Wars project. Right now, we're getting so entitled when it comes to our Star Wars because we get it so often. We don't know. We don't know that us as adults don't know that a thirst for yeah. a new project. Oh, you mean like waiting uh, between 1983 to 1999 or waiting? Between, yeah, just, uh, a, just a gap. Yeah. A five-year gap or a 10-year gap or something that... 2005 to 2015, yeah. Just something, it, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, yeah. I'm just kind of weird about, about it. We're getting so um, much of I it. Think, I think that's a hard prospect to do. I think because it's like we go, we are getting so much Star Wars content now, it's like putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Like to just draw it back completely is like, that's tough. But I do see what you're saying. It would make it feel more special because the more content you crank out there, the less special it feels. Yeah. And I think um, the Marvel projects are feeling that way for me now. Oh, phase four. I think everybody's kind of just like, you know, whispering to their neighbor about phase four. Nobody's really thrilled about the entirety of phase four. It's been like, OK, yeah, pretty good. But like on a whole, like there's nothing that's wowed me since Avengers Endgame. Well, the the defense on that I've heard is, well, look at phase one. Phase one was a building just like phase four is a building. Well, I'm like phase one. I'm looking back on it. It's like, I loved Iron Man. Oh, I love Iron I, Man. Absolutely. I, I loved all those movies. I don't, yeah. I can't say I love any of the phase four movies. No, I've walked out of the past two movies thinking, I don't know if I'm going to watch those again. I, um, Black Panther is the first one that I was just, I didn't, I, you know, if I had the chance to go see it, I would, but it's like during the holidays, things are busy. It got to the point where it came out and it was in theaters and it was like, okay, do I make the time to go and see this or do I just, you know, listen to the spoilers on YouTube and from yourself? And like, that's what I ended up doing. I I haven't seen it and I won't probably now until it starts streaming or something. I'm yeah. Watch it. It, it, the beginning was great. The beginning was emotional. Yeah. Name War was fantastic. The story sucked. Mm. I mean, that, that's just my, and I thought the ending was a cop out. 
Okay. The whole T'Challa thing. Yeah. I mean, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I don't want to ruin it for if you're still waiting to see it. But right. I thought it, I thought it was a cop out. I walked I walked out of the theater going, what? I was just yeah. I, there was a confusion between me and my wife. We're like, what how did that end? Who's doing what what who has what role going forward? Right. What's what's really happening here? Who's Black Panther? Who who is you know the ruler of Wakanda? Who what's the role between them and Namor? In Telecan, what what is all this? And there's, yeah. I don't think I, we we really didn't have that feeling out of any other movie. But that's Marvel. I mean, that's way off the beaten path here. Well, I mean, that's part of part of Disney. I, I think it all goes hand in hand. Now that Chapek had like a direct tie into to that per se, as far as people's dissatisfaction with Phase Four. But it's just one thing to pile on, you know, to add on to the pile, right? It's just yeah. like during his tenure. We had Phase Four Marvel. We had you know uh, Star Wars content that's cranking out. That's both you know, hot and cold. Uh, we've got all those issues behind the scenes with like the Scarlett Johansson thing and the Pixar being buried. Um, I think it was tough for JPEG to come in and handle that during the pandemic and these very unique years, but mm -hmm. he hasn't shown, it doesn't look like he's shown the kind of leadership that people can really rally oh, no. behind. Did you hear how this went down? Well, I heard rumors that there were like studio heads like Feige and like the studio head of Walt Disney Pictures, like, came in and did kind of a secret backdoor meeting. Something like that makes sense, honestly, because, uh, yeah, it's another thing I wanted to bring up because they just re-signed JPEG for another three years. Three years, yeah. They added three years onto his contract, and within weeks after he re-signed and that was upped, they axed him. You, they lost that on so much money. You don't do that unless there was, like, one last yep. thing or one last push to get it. Yeah, so the day this went down... Chapek was actually at the Elton John concert that they were streaming live oh on God. Disney Plus. And the studio, the, the executives that were with him, their phones started going off. Realizing Chapek's out. And Chapek was, I think they said he was like 30 minutes from actually introducing Elton John live. Shut up. I did not hear this. And he walked out. <laughs> I should not hear this. <laughs> and rumor and what I've heard is he tried to actually go back to his office and his key fob was deactivated. Couldn't even get That's in the building. Hilarious. So wow. they just chopped him. Yeah. And it was one of those like, and it's it's not too, I mean, that's drastic, but it's not too uncommon. When you get laid off from a company, you get escorted out so you don't do any damage. So it's kind of like Matt, like that must feel like if you and you and I, if that happened to you and me. And all of a sudden, our key fob didn't work to get in the building. You and I would be devastated. Like, what is going on? How am I going to support my family? Yeah. For somebody who's a CEO of Disney or any large company, frankly, a day like that must be like a little one. Like, you must be, you know, hopping in the air for joy because it's like, oh, I don't have a job anymore, so I don't have all these this pressure, and but I get I got a golden a $50 parachute. Fifty million dollar yacht, I can go sit in the Caribbean on. Yeah, uh, like I'm already rich, and this company is going to give me tons of other, you know, more money for yeah. not being there because I was fired. Now they're <laughs> obligated to give me all of my contract. Yeah, like I mean, that just must be. Oh yeah, I, I feel terrible for the man. Yeah, <laughs> poor really, JPEG. poor JPEG. But uh, even did, there was more that leaked out. I've been on top of this, seeing that you know I am kind of in that world now. Yeah. I'm just constantly researching. So I'm thinking there had to have been something more that happened. Right. What else happened behind the scenes that hasn't gotten out yet? That at that point that led to this drastic change. Like you said, he they just resigned him. Yes. And come to find out, it's it's slowly coming out that he was cooking the books with Disney Plus. He was Ooh, making really? Disney Plus look more profitable. Than it truly where, where was. Where are you hearing this from? Uh, this was from uh, Vanity Fair. This was from uh, Hollywood Reporter. Uh, I was, okay, so this is something that's trickled out there to legit. Yeah. Um, so okay. yeah, big sources are actually are putting this out there. Now they're they're kind of it's, it's coming gotta out be big at this point. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, they're saying that he was rearranging things to make Disney Plus look more profitable for the actual stock uh, stock prices. Wow. You know, and that was the final straw, essentially. You know, he, he might have been doing something that would have been overlooked if everything else was OK. But since there was such a push and dissatisfaction with him, honestly, they could have caught him on anything, any any misstep, anything that would have been considered. He's a, charging his lunch offense. to the Disney card. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> JPEG, you're out, buddy. Um, yeah. But is well, this a mess Iger can fix in, in two years? He's got two years. It's a limited two year deal. This is tough. Okay, so I, 
you know, pandemic had its own issues. This is tough. If you have a company as large as Disney and you feel as though it's kind of rudderless and directionless right now, you have to put direction back in it. You have to put confidence in your shareholders again, and you have to find your own replacement again. Yeah. And do it right the second time because the first time was a failure pretty much. Yeah, and, that, and that's one of the big failures of Iger. That yeah. was his hand-picked replacement. Right. Um, so, that's a lot on I, Iger's plate right in now. In two years. I, I, yeah. I highly... Yeah. He's going to need more than two. And right now it's only two. And it's, I think it's like it's a hard stop two, too, also. Yeah. So I'm not sure if he can fix the issues that have taken place in two years. And because he's going to have to go ahead and, in reality, find his replacement within the next, like, five months. Oh, yeah. And have him work side by side with him. Right. And give him the tutelage that he needs to move this company forward, you know, in a way that progresses them, puts them back to where they were. So they've lost a lot of money. But there's also the rumor that Iger's back to put bring up Disney back and sell to Apple. Do you see that? I did see that headline. I didn't read the news story, but that's huge. I, I doubt that. I, I, I highly doubt. My, my biggest thing is, why would Apple want to get into the theme park in the cruise business and the hotels right i mean they're you can't, doing you can't separate you can't separate them. yeah no you are a billion you know trillion dollar company yeah and what you're doing why take on that whole side of entertainment if it was just content that's one thing right but if it's with parks and it's with cruises and hotels and everything else that disney's got going on that's 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 more than that. That's why I don't buy the story. That is a lot to take on unless Apple would just simply buy them just to own it and keep everything intact as a whole. But then you have a pretty much your one of your main competitors on the same thing. But if you own your main competitor, then, I mean, you're still making money hand over fist. I don't know. That's that's a big thing. I, I just feel like that price tag is even a company like Apple or Amazon to buy Disney. Cause I, I, to me, Disney is on equal footing with an well, Apple or an Amazon. With, okay. So I, I, we got to take this with a grain of salt. This is a, I, I'm getting this information from Campia. Yeah. Right. Campia was basically saying that Disney is worth billions, like, like 32 billion or something. It's in, it's in a lower range right now. Yeah. And Apple is worth trillions. So Apple can basically buy this company like three or four times over right now because of the damage that Disney has taken during the pandemic. Right. Wow. So they can buy them and sell them and it won't, it wouldn't even affect Apple's bottom line right now. Do you think Iger would do something like that? Or allow I mean, that he, I mean, he's known for his negotiation and his, I mean, that's his thing. If that's what the board wants and the you know, stockholders want, uh, but I, I, I don't I know how like I said, would feel about that. If that if that were to take place, I had weird feelings about when Disney bought 20th Century Fox. Yeah, because it's like I had feelings beyond just, oh, great. The X-Men and Fantastic Four get to be in the Marvel Universe. Like that was the only thing that like geeks like us talked about. But like just the rich history of 20th Century Fox as its own studio, you know, that the opening fanfare that would open movies and they have their own lineage of Hollywood films and classics and stuff. Yeah. And it's like now that's just a part of this Disney machine. And um I, I don't know and for the disney machine to be sold to the apple machine it's like who do you root for in that <laughs> i kind of don't i don't think that that would get passed would be approved i don't think that merger right. would be approved yeah because it's going to start becoming more of more of a monopoly yeah i i think it wouldn't pass that point but like i said i mean that's that uh but there is something else within the, the house of mouse that we need to talk about yeah and it's uh avatar which is coming out next month coming yeah Oh uh, yeah, what is the release date on that? I December, think it's the it 19th, weekend? December 19th. Oh, okay, so it's closer to Christmas, not the Yeah, you know, yeah. It's more of a Christmas release, December. yeah. Okay. And we have differing opinions on the movie, and we actually have I personally have a bet with my drunken movie theater's Kyle because both him and uh and Trisha over there don't like the movie at all. They don't like the original movie. They think it's just it's no good. It's just, it's just convoluted. Everything. They don't know the characters' names or anything. They they just don't care. <laughs> On my side of the fence is that's the movie I've ever, I've only seen in the theater. I think I've seen it now four times in the theater. I've yeah. never seen a movie more than twice in the theater. So I've seen it 
twice when it uh, three i think three times when it first is that released. because of the 3d or is that because you love the movie 3d and the movie i think that this just as a whole because when i went back i just actually re- seen it again i took zach to see yeah. it uh, about a month ago when they re-released it and just the spectacle in IMAX and the visuals and I, I mean I enjoy the story yeah okay the story it's pieces and everything from a whole bunch Somewhat of different basic. movies yeah but it's just I, I find it fun and I, I, I'll, I'll go to the theater and I'll defend this I love the Transformer movies I don't go for any other reason besides robots and explosions I don't I, I don't read too much into the stories I'm just going for fun. And if I can go to a movie and have a blast, that's what I am. And that, that's what Avatar is for me. I, I love the movie. I watched it at home a couple times. It doesn't have that same feeling for me at home. Right. But in the theater, I'm never going to skip it. And this is a movie I'll probably see multiple times in the theater. The Way of Water coming up. You and I have, uh, you brought up Transformers. I won't get into Transformers. Okay, that's a whole <laughs> different discussion. Because uh, you and I are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. I don't hate Avatar. Like, I think, um, Ab- I love James Cameron as a director. Um, I love his vision. I think he's one of the stalwart directors out there that it's like anytime he releases a movie, because there's so few and far between, he's up there with Spielberg and, you know, some of the greats. It's like James Cameron, amazing director. Um, the original Avatar, I liked. I thought the story was a little basic. I think what people came for were the special effects, because what he put on screen, not only the 3D, but just the, the visual motion capture. Yeah. yeah. Um, we saw stuff with Gollum, but even like the Navi looked even better than Gollum did in Lord of the Rings. Like they were so, it was alien, but it was also so realistic. The facial like acting, like you didn't lose any of the actors performances and even the face, like it was so transcendent as far as what special effects were able to deliver at that point in 2009 that I think it just blew people away. And on top of that, the 3D that blew people away. Yeah. It ushered in a whole new era of 3D movies. Like Avatar is to blame for a decade of... You know, and it's the only know, one that did it right. Like, I don't yeah. think there was another 3D movie that was really worth its its time in 3D. No, like because everyone it was went... built from the ground up to be 3D. Like, yeah. that's what Cameron envisioned from the get-go, as opposed to just, like, laying a 3D element over its uh, an already completed film, which a lot of those things did. It was post-processing. Um. I so I think Avatar deserves its place as far as you know in history and uh, as far as the original moneymaker. Me personally, as far as the sequel coming out, I have a ton of hesitation because I just don't think we are in the same place we were in 2009. I think unless the way of water has some kind of new special effects technical thing that we've never seen before on screen and we're just blown away by the something new, and I've seen the trailer and I've kept up on new stories there's like new there's not like no new 4d element or the motion capture is the same i think it's just a, a refining of the original special effects and maybe a refining of the story itself um but i don't know if that's enough to capture today's audience i mean we're 12 13 years out from the original release of the first one and i know it, you love the franchise but yeah. i don't know if it has the same kind of cultural relevance that uh stuff like star wars or the marvel movies have had over the last i think it's gonna fall into that same thing i was saying about us not getting a whole lot of star wars like if we stop the star wars train for a while Mm -hmm. i think there's gonna be enough curiosity for people to flock back and i mean they're already calling for it to have you know 150 to 170 million dollar opening weekend which that's massive yeah so and with actually getting announced that it's going to have a china release and they love some avatar over there yeah so it, it's going to be up in the billion dollar range again it won't touch two i think the original one hit two so i mean it's probably going to be half of what it was but i still think it's going to outgross it's going to be a top top five movie top six movie maybe of all time again i i just i've, I've got i've got uh i got faith in it really i saw some report though that it won't be profitable unless it hits that 200 billion mark yes just- now there was there was a report and uh once again i i, I watch a lot of campia and he yeah, broke yeah. it down it's like it has to there's no way that they're gonna put a billion dollars worth of advertising into place which we, we haven't seen a billion dollars worth of advertising no not yet so i think <laughs> we'll was, get there at some point within our lifetime we'll see it yeah it was more we think it's more of a uh a tongue-in-cheek from cameron 
Yeah. Because Cameron's got a way of sticking his foot right in his mouth over and over about complaining about Marvel movies and superhero movies and run times and how uh, Marvel actors aren't true actors. They're they're re- recreating, you know, whatever oh, he character that? that they're on. Yeah, it's it's. Every does time he, he, does he realize that some of his actors in Avatar are in the Marvel universe. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one thing. It, well, it's 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 cool to do this. Spielberg has done this. Quentin Tarantino has done this. Cameron yeah. does this. They all yeah. bash the the superhero movie genre because it's the cool thing. The cool kids do it. Yeah. So, I if it's, if he keeps his mouth shut, which he doesn't know how to do, but if he keeps his mouth shut, I think the movie's going to do fine. It's going to be the biggest movie of the year. And I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I got my tickets already. I'm taking Zach. My wife wasn't interested. So there's that There's that part of the family already that just wasn't interested. There you go. There's a part of your household already that has yeah. no interest. Well, she, in didn't, she didn't really see the first one. She didn't care for the first one, you know, to go see it. And Zach, when I took him just to, like last month, he, he said, whoa. Yeah. Like three or four times within the first like 10 minutes of the movie. And it's just the 3D glasses that are giving him a problem. It's hard for him to wear the 3D glasses over top of his glasses. Uh huh. Which I know you struggle with as well. Yeah. That's why it's never been a fad that I've embraced. I've point. gotten away from it. I've gotten away from the three. If I have an option between the 3D 3D theater and the non, I'll go non now. Because just because the theater, the seating in the theaters are better. Because they're not packing you in like sardines to get as much as you can out of the IMAX 3D, you know, yeah. features. I have a theory. Um, I feel like overall it's going to be a success. It's going to be a successful release because I think there's n- enough of a hunger out there for new or what could be considered like new content. You know, Avatar's only had one movie. We're yeah. inundated with all these franchises that are part of this like larger thing where there's uh, video games, books, comic books, uh, TV shows, uh, movies like uh, for something new or be considered new and a continuation out of something that did, ha- did have a lot of success, you know, 10 plus years ago there's enough there where it's going to be considered successful. I just don't know. There's going to be enough of a demand for it, at least domestically. I think it's going to make its money mostly overseas in China. I think there's probably more of a demand out there because a lot of, a lot of our Marvel stuff is almost like, you know, Captain America. And it's like the Marvel stuff and star Wars stuff has success over there, but not as much as, you know, of a fervor that there is here in the States, I think. Yeah. Um, but and I think it might be the opposite with Avatar. I think just uh, there might be a more of an interest and demand over there. But I think uh, domestically it's not going to hit and it's not going to have the same impact that that first one did. I think it's going to have the same kind of sequelitis that any a lot of part twos of stories have, honestly, where it's like you think fondly of the original and then you're like, oh yeah, they made a sequel of that. And this is a se- and that's not good enough because this is something Cameron's been working on for a decade plus, dude. Yeah. How how many times have we heard, oh, Avatar 2 were being released? I this think it's year, supposed to be released back in 17 originally. Yeah. Yeah. And now well, we're looking at 2022, almost 2023. Oh, and now, plus Cameron said that he was like working on like four or five. Yeah, there, there yeah, there's like three or four more coming. Yeah. Uh, in this now, I don't know if that's necessary. Right. I mean, but I mean, I've been blown away by the previews. I mean, at home, it's lackluster, just like the first one. It doesn't have the same feeling. Yeah. But in the theater, watching it, I actually seen the trailer in 3D because I, I, they showed it in front of at the, the re-release of Avatar, which makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it was phenomenal looking. The, all the stuff that happened in the water that's going on, and then there's a shot where they come up, and there's like something burning, and it, it just it looks phenomenal. So, I mean, the, the look of it, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, it's the biggest knock I've heard so far on it is all the trailers have been released. We truly don't know what this movie's about. There's been no, and no... that could be a good thing. Honestly. Th- that could be that, that could yeah. be a good thing, but uh, I mean, I just look at it as like I, at the end of the first one, uh, that I can't the scrawny guy I was walking out basically let everything. I don't remember his name, but he said, you know, this isn't over, and it just re- it's just basically they're just returning. So it could be, if it's just a rehash of the first story that could be where the downfall of the the movie is. Yeah. That's another big point of this. It's just like, what are you going to do with the actual story? Cause in my opinion, like I said, the first story is so basic as far as its elements, it's hero. uh, It's something that we'd seen before and dances with wolves and Fern Gully, the last rainforest. It's just like this outsider coming in, um, you know, getting to know the native people and becoming one with them and, you know, 
helping in a fight against the people that he came from, you know, like that kind of story has become like in all sorts of forms and shapes. And Avatar just kind of slapped a space themed sticker on top of it. And, um, but I was story wise, technically beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like if you want, if you seriously, and if he's seriously considering going like, you know, four or five sequels, I'm hoping that he has something better in mind as far as like, let's get into character growth. Let's get into surprising plot progressions. Let's get into something that's going to draw us back story wise, especially since I don't think there's going to be as much technical specter. I wonder if this is just hit me. I wonder how important it is to Disney for it to be a billion dollar movie. Cause think, think about this for a second. Yes. They want it to be profitable. They want all the, you know, the, the bells and whistles they can get out of the theater, but there's so many ancillary things with this movie and this, in this world of Pandora, because they have Pandora in animal kingdom. Yeah. So this movie can actually bump ticket sales to that park for the experience of going to Pandora and riding the two rides they've got there, you know, actually in Disney. Yeah. You think that may play a part of it? And then they kind of be like, you know what? We want it to be great, but if we see a bump here, it shows it was more successful than maybe the movie theaters are showing. Um, they, uh, so I'll give you that there is more, more way, more ways than one to make money from this property in particular. Like, um, yeah. And I don't think there's anything else in the, in the 20th century Fox, um, umbrella that has as much potential to give them more bang for their buck than the avatar franchise, because it's like, what are they going to do? Open a section of de- of their park dedicated to die hard or home alone or, yeah. <laughs> You know, some of the other 20th Century Fox properties, it's like X-Men are going to be Marvel. You know, it's going to be um, as far as making that purchase. I think Avatar um, is probably going to be the one that gives them the most bang for the buck. And you're, you're right. Yeah. Pandora. You've seen what Pandora. Dude, Avenue. the Flight of Passage ride is yeah. one of, if not the best ride in Disney. Yeah, that was phenomenal. And Zach riding that ride and riding the Banshee. And then seeing the movie and then seeing them fly in the movie, seeing him connect the dots, walking in the park and seeing the floating islands right. and then them flying into the floating islands during the movie at, for a kid's eyes and, and sitting with him in the dark theater and still feeling the the connection and everything happening, the yeah. wonder. And that's, that's really what. It, and I think it's this movie coming out, maybe even beyond us. This is now directed at the generation that really didn't grow up with the first one. And are growing up with the park, per se, and connecting those dots. But I think it's going to be a big one. I've got a pie on the face with Kyle from everybody. Yeah, uh, what specifically is your, uh, what? how do you win and how does Kyle win? With so originally, I just put it out there. So, you, you know, you want to go ahead and put a bet on the gross of these two movies. Which one will be bigger, yeah. Black Panther, What Kind of Forever, or uh, the Avatar movie, uh, Way of Water? And then he put the parameters in place very smartly. That it will be domestic, not total gross. Yes. Because he's like, it's does not Black Panther does not stand a chance. Not gonna fly overseas. I mean overseas. It's okay, but yeah. It, yeah, no, no, it's it's not gonna hold a candle overall gross right. to Avatar. So no, without even biting it out of the back in the eyelash, I believe. I was like, you know what? Let's do it. And the loser takes a pie and we'll go ahead and uh We'll record it, put it on Twitter. We'll, we'll put it somewhere so everyone, all of our followers can so see. Domestic gross by when? By what point is the end date? Rele- when it's no longer in theaters. So we're pretty much at the end of Black Panther's run. But Black Panther actually had a big day yesterday, I think it was. But yeah. it's starting to trail pretty pretty heavily. So not by like calendar year end, because that would have given Black Panther a big uh, advantage. But Yeah, no, no. The Theatr- day- theatrical run. Yeah, okay. When it's, when it's removed from the theaters. Oh yeah, no, that'd have been dumb on my part. That would have been yeah. no way. <laughs> but we'll know that we'll pretty much know the results by what, like end of January or something. Yeah, in that ballpark, January, yeah. mid-February. We'll have we'll have two numbers to set on. So okay, this is what, what they did. So I have a bad habit of losing these bets. You guys have seen <laughs> these multiple times on our channel. Yeah. So, but it's always a fun one. It, it's not, it doesn't hurt. It's not financial. It's just a fun, you know, way to go ahead and they work in the movie theater business. They both right. run the movie theater. One's the CEO of the, uh, the theater. The other one is the ma- head manager in the theater. And they've been in it for the past like 20 plus years. Yeah. I'm some schmuck from the outside that just watches <laughs> it and enjoys it. So we'll, we'll see what uh, happens there. You are always stepping in it. <laughs> I am, but it's fun to step in. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, guys, you know, we went on a lot longer than we really intended on going on about that. We actually have two shows to talk about here. And yeah. the real reason we're here, uh, talk about the what? The penult- penultimate episode of pan- of uh, The Peripheral and then the season finale of Andor. Right. So let's just go ahead and jump into The Peripheral, see what we thought about it, see if it's still holding our attention, and then uh, we'll roll into Andor as well. What are you asking of me? Destroy the Zubolks, Flynn Fisher, and everyone associated with them, both here and in the stub. <laughs> you make it sound so simple. As if I could merely wave a wand. This precedent you'll concede. The Samsonites, their entire clan, erased from the face of the earth. It's quite an awe-inspiring spectacle. An entirely different situation. Mm, was it? Sedition? I should think so. So, the <laughs> peripheral. Okay, so that scene in particular, you cut the most important part of that scene out for to show, and that's the scene that the part of the scene that like makes the most sense as far as where we go from here. What is Sharice telling or asking of Lobeer at this point? Yeah, um, it was interesting to see their dynamic because the last episode we saw saw Lobeer put our futuristic group on their heels a bit, like she just came in like you know a whirlwind, and they were all like fearful of her. Right? Yeah. And here we almost see the opposite where Sharice comes into Lobier's lair and puts Lobier on her heel a bit, just talking about the dynamic between her and uh, the robotic assistant that Lobier yeah, has. Yeah, her daughter, like, that apparently her daughter died. So she recreated yeah. her daughter, who's been calling her mom yeah. the whole time. So I, I didn't connect the dots until she basically said, hey, this is that. Yeah. Um, but there was a whole middle portion of that conversation between those two that just went like, I was trying to follow along. I don't know if it's because I was tired or they were just using too much in universe vocabulary. Right. But I, I had a hard time following their conversation until it got to the point that you cut out where it's finally just like Therese was just like, Hey, uh, kill those people for me. I'm, I've been trying to kill them. Um, it'd be great if you could do it. Yeah. Just wipe them out. And it's not, <laughs> you know, it's like it's happened before. <laughs> There's yeah. precedent already in place for this. Yeah. So yeah, the dynamic there was interesting because we haven't seen that dynamic before. It, right. But are we are we starting to get an idea on who is good and who is not so good? But I I don't I I don't know. It's convoluted. This whole future thing is so convoluted to me. A little bit with the with the we had a lot of meaty scenes with the twins, the ones that have their own language. Um, we had that whole scene where uh, what's the main guy's name with the mustache? The I main guy with the name. The main, oh, um, uh, the head guy, of the futuristic group. Oh, Levi? Levi, yeah. That scene between him and the twins. Uh, I don't know if they're twins. It might just be brother. I don't know even if they're brother and sister. You know, the, the male and female that are always, you know, talking their own language to each other. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I, th- I think it's almost like husband-wife type setup. I, I think okay. it's I think it's that type of relationship. Okay. Um, but yeah, he calls them out. He he well, we discover that he he's aware of their coded language. He can listen to everything they're saying and understand it so that was a reveal um plus he threatened them because i guess they were like dipping out because there's so much heat on on levi right now that i guess they were talking about maybe stealing some data and like dipping out and selling it to the highest bidder and he caught them on that and threatened them to get kind of get back in line so i did have some feelings of like well maybe i should be on their side but not necessarily levi's but yeah, it's a little, it's still cloudy as far as like, be on the size Sharice, because it sounds like she's the one that developed all this tech. Yeah. And then there's a chip that they put in people's heads to control them that could be hacked. I I I I don't know. Oh, and there's something else going on with bacteria and something about back um uh Lynn is has some sort of bacteria that and maybe that's what's given her the shakes and stuff. Uh that's what oh, I, I assume that. anyway. Oh, yeah, th- that's the problem with this show right now. It's just like they are just like flooding you with story. And it's at this point, it's just hard to keep up. Well, then they talked about the jackpot and how the jackpot's being sped up by, you know, humanity. Humanity is the one that's actually speeding the jackpot up, greed and everything. Yeah. So like, this okay. particular stub, right, of, of the world that Flynn lives in, I think they were saying that the jackpot is coming quicker than it did previously. Um, that's what I got from that. Yeah, no, yeah. No, so now what I've got was there's two different storylines. There's two different timelines. There's one where uh, Flynn's brother, uh, Burton, Burton actually dies. 
or yeah. is the one that is is hurt and it's not his buddy uh connor yeah, yeah. and then flynn actually marries the sheriff or, right so it's like and i guess that was the original timeline that led up to the future that we are traveling to now um but because look i don't know <laughs> i'm i'm so lost and then the, the whole the whole like personality thing that changed where the the sheriff from what's his name um the young kid oh um, um i know who you're talking about yeah but anyway the, the, where it the comes year. yeah when he comes to finding out that the, the main the sheriff sheriff is actually in cahoots with the old buddy there old dude there and then he comes in and he, he murders him why why would i believe that that personality change from going from being nothing but good and doing everything by the book and everything yeah. the whole way right and then within five minutes he comes in murders the sheriff and goes in and takes out the, the other guy as well thinks he takes out the other guy right i bought that the reason that i did buy that is because he's been a few steps behind each and every time um this character this kind of uh somewhat love interest to flynn He's been constantly having people lie to him, and he's just, like, on his back foot all the time. And finally, he gets his suspicions confirmed by the sheriff himself. The sheriff's basically calling him, like, a, an idiot. Like, you've been working for the bad... You think you're this righteous dude, and you've been working for me, who's been just working for the bad guy the whole time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, you're nothing. You're an idiot. Probably. Like, go go be a good lapdog and bring Burton and Flynn to us so we can take care of him. Just go do it, you idiot. So, and I got the rage as far as like basically his, his entire world is shook. His position in the town, it, the actions that he's taken, it's all been basically flipped up, upside down because he's been following the role of this guy who is essentially just a bought and paid man. So I get the desperation. Plus, the if he didn't have that futuristic weapon, the shockwave thing, I don't think he would have gone back. But because he had such, he knew that he had such an upper hand with that weapon and that thing. I think maybe that's what gave him some confidence to go back. But at this point, I I, I buy the confusion and desperation that's coming at him. With it. Did you? Okay, I thought it was a little bit of reach. I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't. I I. But I, I get that because he's been such a boy scout up to this point. Yeah, that is a long way to travel. Honestly. From yeah, going from being what he was to questioning yeah. things inside the precinct, then being told to arrest Flynn and Burton. But what's and his move here? Does he? He's not going to work for I forget the the gangster's name. Uh, so. Corbell. He's not going to work for Corbell, is he? I mean, no. Corbell's the one who's like, "Hey, I got a deal for you." He's basically trying to get out of the situation. I was hoping that now this deputy and I forget his name too. See, the, the show is Tommy. Yeah, Tommy. I was hoping that Tommy now finally goes back to Burton. Hey, here's what's just happened. I'm in the shit now too. I've got a couple bodies under me that you know um like i'm here i'm i'm here to work with you guys can you please let me know what's going on i just use this futuristic weapon <laughs> yeah well did out... you watch any of the preview for next week no i haven't do you want me to tell you what it, the preview yeah, kind of... okay yeah. so there is a, a brief scene where tommy is being approached by i guess another officer and he's like oh one of or is it emt he's like, oh one of them have a pulse he's like which one so oh, i'm guessing okay. corbell's not dead it's... oh it's got to be yeah that thing will stun you and and bring it to the point of almost dying but yeah i don't think yeah I, I would you know i would never put a bullet in them you're basically you have to you have to make sure they're dead by that point yeah i mean you're already that deep in you got to finish off the job but i mean there was that scene there was the whole uh mom lost her vision again and then that guy yeah. basically took them and was waiting for you know everyone to show up at the urgent care and he called a bullet and then they, but but Burton's buddy died because he got stabbed up. He got stabbed many, 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 many times and was still okay. kicking. That's another thing. That whole fight scene between the serial killer and that guy. Serial came up and stabbed him a good four or five times initially, and then they had a whole fight scene. Yeah, they got <laughs> like, stabbed what? like 20 times before the other guy gave up. Yeah, like, um, and in my head, it was like, is that because of the haptics that are installed in them? Is it giving them a little bit more uh, adrenaline and longevity to, to stay in the fight? That's what I wrote it off to. That might not be the case, but that, that that was jarring to say the least. That was that was a little much. Yeah. Uh yeah, as a whole, man, I'm I'm it's this the show's starting to be a, a slog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's so much in it, and it's like 
it's almost relying on the people that know the book mm-hmm. to be able to enjoy the show. And that wasn't how it began. Like, I, I still no. think the acting in it's great. I still enjoy, you know, Chloe, Chloe Morantz, uh, yeah, Chloe, Chloe Grace Morantz, Morantz. Yeah. you know, Jack Rayner as Burn. I'm, I'm still enjoying all that. It's just the story itself is starting to really become hard to follow and too much. Yeah, the pacing was good the first two, three episodes, and it was uh, it was nice. And progressively, I think maybe they've overestimated how much the um, audience will be able to follow along. Like, okay, well, we'll just introduce this concept once and then just like barrage you with it in the next few episodes. Uh, we'll bring in this character in this episode and have him die the following episode. Um, now I'm wondering if Lobier, if we'll just see Lobier died next episode. It's like, yeah, we'll, we'll introduce and, all these new characters, all these new concepts. Some will stay, some will go. We'll start naming things off that you should recognize because we named it once. But um, yeah, it's becoming a little daunting at this point. I mean, the jackpot. I mean, I think they could have stopped right there and le- leaned into the jackpot. Mm-hmm. What is the jackpot? I thought that was some of the coolest stuff that they've done in the show between right. the visuals and the expect- uh, explanation and the. The you know the nuke that goes off in the town that they live in, all of that. I want to know more about that. I just they they gave us that, and then they pulled it away. And what I really enjoyed about the first half of the show too was the dichotomy between this futuristic spy thriller in Britain and the Sons of Anarchy Sons of Anarchy type drama, North Carolina drama, and they still have that to an extent, but it's not as sharp i guess there's not as much um like direct correlation and direct interaction it's like it's very separate now where it's like um there's stuff going on here and then there's separate stuff going on here and those two stories don't necessarily combine it's like the north carolina serial killer stuff that was its own separate danger and then the them dealing with low beer and having that you know video game fight up the building was totally separate and it's just um, it felt like they mashed two separate stories together as opposed to have wing, one co- cohesive thing. I don't know what I'm trying to say. It just feels different at this point. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there's no... Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Because the two stories in the beginning of this show felt like one story. Mm-hmm. And now the two stories feel detached from each they other. Do. They do feel detached, yeah. So, I mean, even when, you know, everyone is forward and they're in the stubs and everything, they're doing what they're doing. It just, it, it does, it, I'm, I have my phone in my hand. And no, it's hard to of... watch this show with your phone in your hand. Yeah. Because like you said, they're throwing so much at you, but they're so, they're throwing so much at me. I'm like, I, I, I just, I just can't take it. And then if I'm watching it at like midnight, it's even harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so that's i mean that like you said that's the penultimate episode of the peripheral what we got the finale next week a season the one? finale is next week have we had uh, seen any announcements on them saying there's going to be a season two i have no idea man and i feel like they've buried this on their on uh yeah. amazon prime like right. you have to search for this show now you do. so it's not like the boys yeah or you know any of the other ones that were like right there or lord of the rings that right. you know, every time you load Amazon Prime Video, it's in your face. Yeah. This here has been shuffled. Like you got to hit the scroll button to find it. And uh, it's not looking good for the fate of the peripheral on Amazon Prime. <laughs> no, it really isn't. It's disappointing because I was I was really hoping the show was going to be good, and it, it started out so strong, and it's kind yeah. of fizzled from there. Well, we'll be here next week to talk about the finale. Don't worry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll see if, if it comes back for season two. And we'll see how season one ends. Maybe that it'll have a kind of a finale where you and I are like, okay, this is cool. Yeah, can the, uh, that's a good question, though. Can the finale save the second half of the show and make it a show that we're like, okay, that was all right. Is, is it redeemable within the last hour? It's got a lot of work to do, but uh, I don't know at this point. I don't have a ton of faith in it. Okay, well, guys, join us next week as we talk the the finale of Peripheral. Now we actually have to talk the finale of Andor. I don't tell you this. If I could do it again, I'd wake up early and be fighting these bastards from the start. 
fight the Empire! There we go. The finale of Andor. What were your initial thoughts at the end of that? I read somewhere that um, her last phrase there, fight the Empire, actually should have been the Empire. <laughs> <laughs> and Disney changed it. Yeah. Um, that, well, yeah, I don't think like, that would go over very well in a family-friendly uh No, but this, this Andor show, it, honestly, would kind of fit in Andor. Andor has pushed the envelope in a lot of different ways. Um what do I feel? And this is probably going to be, you know, to wrap up here, we're going to talk about Andor as a whole, including the finale. Um, I really liked Andor. I thought it was a swing. I thought it was a big swing for them to take. Um, Andor definitely does not feel cookie cutter. You know what I mean? It doesn't oh, yeah. feel like a continuation of Book of Boba. You know how like Book of Boba just felt like maybe a detour of the Mandalorian? They even oh, yeah, had absolutely. A... Definitely when he was in it. Yeah, exactly. Like they just had the Mandalorian in there and like, this doesn't feel like those shows at all. Like, and not to say that I don't like those shows. I love the Mandalorian. Um, but like this felt very different and, and hit a spot that I think is very satisfying for the adult star Wars fan. The person that grew up with the original trilogy and mm -hmm. maybe even the, the, the prequel trilogy and liked rogue one like you. Yeah. Um, I'll have to ask you for me. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I, I like rogue one as a movie. Um, I don't, fanatically as uh, like it as much as you do maybe but and i had a lot of questions as far as how i would feel about following just cassie and andor through an entire show but they did a, enough around cassie and andor where mm -hmm. they, they kept all 12 of these episodes interesting like i was engaged throughout the entirety for this span, span of 12 episodes okay we, we differ a little bit there okay okay so the only reason i say we differ there is i yeah. i was underwhelmed by the finale. The finale was, was underwhelming for me. We okay. were building up to this whole uh, conflict with Anton Krieger. Mm -hmm. That all happened off camera. We got nothing from it. True. So we see nothing with Saul Guerrero. We see nothing with Anton Krieger. They're all dead. Uh, we got a little bit of, I guess, of the Empire knowing that Mom Moth was moving money around. But her driver thinks it's because her husband's gambling problem. Okay, that, that's enough of a cover to kind of... I have a quick question about that. Yeah, so it's like the whole reason that she was doing this thing and making this deal with this Chandrillan, um, you know, crime lord or whatever, right, from the last episode and yeah. this whole, like, you know, marry your daughter off to my son thing was to cover up that money. But then in this episode, it see it in this episode, it seems like she finds a way to cover up for that money without him. And yet they're still going through with the marriage. I think that is there. They're speaking of money transfers that took place prior to her, you know, dealing with this other guy. Because she's been moving money for a while. And I think they've been watching her. Okay. So I think all of that is before the that that scene there that I took see. place. Because yeah, she still did go ahead and I guess matched her daughter with that guy's daughter, son. So that is more of an arrangement for future things. Yeah, that's how I took thing, it. Yes. Okay. The gambling thing covers the debts that were already in place. Yeah. And they're going to go ahead and let him dig his own hole, which could be, you know, detrimental to Mothma. I mean, that, that I actually could... love that scene with Mothma and her husband in the backseat. Cause you know, the entire time he's playing like, I didn't do anything. I, like, I believe him. I don't think he's been gambling. Yeah, I don't think he was gambling. I still hold out belief that he is actually a part of another rebel cell that she's not aware of. Oh, really? I still hold that belief. I think that would be fantastic storytelling. That yeah. they're both at each other's throats, but they're both fighting for the same thing. They're fighting differently and have no idea they're fighting together. <laughs> I think that would be a fun... That would fit. The adult storytelling line that they're going through. Hey, that's true. Look, I, I still don't see that. But if that's something that sh uh, you know pokes his head out in season two, which there will be a season two of Andor, I think yeah. everybody can agree that that's something to look forward to. That's a good thing. Um, yeah, that would be an interesting way for Mon Mothma to go. I think there's got to be some resolution to see what happens to Mon Mothma's family, uh, how she's separated. Does the daughter just marry off to this Chandrillan guy and she doesn't really see him? Well, we don't get nothing from Chandrilla in any of the movies or anything else. They could still right. be alive on Chandrilla. We just have no idea about it because they just kind of cut the characters off. 
you blew my mind a couple weeks ago where you were like, is Bail Organa still alive? And I was like, no, but wait a second. But there's Maybe no reason a... to think he's not because he's never on planet. His wife may very well could be dead, but he <laughs> right. may not. He may not be on planet. He could have. He could have been on Coruscant when that took place. I know that. That's that blew my mind. Uh, and may, maybe that's why Leia is. Uh, she's heartbroken, but she's maybe not as heartbroken as uh, who knows. That's a whole different thing. That's like theory time. Theory time. <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, as a whole, I I get where you're coming from as far as this uh, finale being a bit underwhelming. I can see that point, especially with some of the plot points that were just kind of done off screen. Um, I did like that all of the characters seemed to coalesce and join together on Ferrix. Okay, yeah. Um, we were, and to use um, Andor's mom's funeral as kind of a backdrop for that, because at the end of the day, like, she got what she would have wanted. It was like her words and kind of her passing was kind of a spark um for the planet to start for the planet yeah and for andor himself to finally move closer towards because now uh, this is the very last scene of this the the entire time luthan's been looking to just kill andor to dispose of him because he's a loose end yeah and he's hired vel to do the same thing and so the people that were underneath him and the entire time i think vel had a hard time because vel the entire time was like I got a feeling from her that she didn't feel great about killing off Andor. Like, I don't think she wanted to. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of there too. To. Um, so now he finally Andor finally is able to escape. A, a, basically, an entire brigade of the Empire is there. Well, let's the talk city. about them real quick. I yeah. enjoyed seeing the Empire. Yeah, being deadly. I, yeah. I enjoyed seeing the you know the the perception of a stormtrooper. Not being, I shoot and miss every time. I, I love seeing them agree. actually be fear, being feared. Because when they I were agree. shooting, they were hitting. They yes. weren't like firing 10 feet on each side of them. Yes, I agree. There were moments, even when Dedra was like telling her men what to do and like going through the halls and the buildings with such authority and saying exactly what needs to be done. The structure of the Empire was very uh, scary in this episode in particular and throughout it, I, I, in my head, it's funny you say that because in my head, I was just have visioning envisioning like the stormtroopers on Endor, like with Ewoks throwing rocks at their helmets and stuff. <laughs> and like how goofy that feels in comparison to this empire where they're just like so scary. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Talking about snipers. You don't have snipers unless you got guys that can actually hit a target. Right. I mean, we we even get the joke in the Mandalorian when they got the cans up and they're or the Womp Rats, whatever they're trying to shoot and they're missing in that one episode. So we they carry on that joke of stormtroopers not being able to hit anything. Yeah. And in this whole series, they hit almost 90% of the time what they're shooting at. Yeah. Which is a much higher kill rate than we've ever seen a stormtrooper. That's yeah, that's that's very true. Um so I did. I like the backdrop and I like all the care. Pretty much every character, even Luthen shows up. Like every character that we've been following, except Mon Mothma, ends up, on, you know, on Ferrix. Um, we have uh, Dedra and uh, who's the guy that's been like, you know, fawning after her. And um, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, dude, the ISB agent or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the one that was living with his mom and got the new job. And uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I don't, I yeah. don't know his name off the top of my head. He's just kind of one of those. Just even, but even even he shows up and he like saves her. He pulls that out. But is that is that crowd. his in back into the empire? Oh, I think or into so. the empire? I is she going to pull him in because he saved her? I think so. Yeah, because she's even worn down to the point where it's like, I guess I should say I should thank you. He's showing the kind of grit and determination that I think she feels is needed. Well, um, yeah, he even said that the thanks not thank you is not necessary. Yeah, it was. I had to save you, or I had to help you. Type right. thing. I did what I did what was needed. Right. Um, and I think she needs people like that because she's constantly fighting for her, her position and for people to like agree with her um thoughts on this whole thing with dead bodies uh, don't talk. On yeah, that's right. And her chase of, of Axis, as she calls it, or, or Luthan's character. And she needs somebody on board that's gonna have the same kind of drive. Um, with her so i think it's a good match i think she's fought too long honestly to have him come on board yeah. i think honestly when she pulled him from the get-go and he was so organized and determined and showed such passion from that original interrogation 
she thought it sh- should have thought more about like, well, who is this guy? And like, how can I use him for my oh, yeah. She just oh, kind of yeah. disposed him un- unnecessarily. And, uh, but I think that, I think she, but was it was good. fitting to her character at the time. That's true. Yeah. It was very fitting to her character at the time. Yeah. And if she takes them on now, it's actually fitting to the character now because she's right. realizing she's getting more and more pushback within. So if she has an actual ally, it may make things easier for her within. Do you think this um, skirmish at Ferrix is going to have some sort of longer consequences as far as the Empire as a whole, kind of like how that bank heist did? Yes. And the reason I say that is because what took place with Anton Krieger, the way that that one guy mentioned it was that this was to wipe the taste out of their mouth of, the Empire of, mouth. Yeah. of that, the whole heist. Right. Now, this taking place is going to put that taste right back in. Yeah. So we're going to see, yeah, there's going to be more. Now, I, if I if I know the structure of the season going forward, we're jumping years. That's what I heard, too. Every three episodes is going to skip a year next season. That's what yeah, I heard. Leading up to the whole events of World of World War I. One. Yeah. So we're not going to get the direct implications of what happened here in episode one of season two. Right. So we're going to get, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to get more of, you know, Andor being with Luthan, because we haven't even talked about that yet. Yeah, you know, going forward when you know Andor and everyone knew where Andor was when Luthen walked in the ship and he talked to the ship to say do this and that and nothing happened. I was actually waiting for Andor to be sitting in the captain's seat and swiveling around. I knew that was coming too, especially when Luthen was walking around the ship. But I did appreciate the fact that Cassian Andor had a whole. I was mentioning this earlier. Had a whole brigade of like the Empire just looking and watching out for him, setting a trap for him. He had Luthen and the people under Luthen, like Vel, working to kill him. And somehow he was, he was able so to slippery, evade all of them. He was able to evade all of them, survive the day, and get the jump on Luthen himself in the ship. By that point, Luthen has to be, and that's how the seri- how the season one ends is on a shot of Luthen just kind of giving a little smile. It's like either at this point, like either kill me now, like you wanted to, or, or bring, bring me, me in. in. Yeah. And at that point, after Cassian shows his worth like that. How can you dispose of somebody like that? No, no, you're, he's he's shown that he is actually valuable to the cause. Yeah, right. If he can be that sneaky and get things done the way he did, uh, it works. And Luthen doesn't even know about like him escaping an entire prison. Oh, some, he doesn't know any know. of that. No, he doesn't know he was detained for yeah. for however long he was detained and how they overthrew you know the guards and everything within the prison and got I've out. Given, I've given the character of Andor some crap this. A season because it seems like the more interesting stuff is happening around Cassie and Andor as opposed to him himself. But looking back on it, the entirety of the season and what he's gone through as a character, um, by the point that he gets to jump on Luthen at the end of this, I'm like, oh yeah, Cassie and Andor is he's pretty he's pretty damn good. <laughs> he's yeah. pretty slippery. I'll give him that, but I still don't think the show is 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 named properly. Yeah, that's fair. I still don't think it's an Andor show. They're right. leaning on Andor as a character that they can lean on because yeah. it's a character that people know. They could have called this Mothma. I mean, they, you know, if they wanted to na- Mothma name... Mothma or Rebellion or... Yeah, yeah something If they bigger. wanted a character yeah. that is known to bring somebody in, they could have leaned on Mothma. They, they, they could have, and they didn't. They could have brought Bail Organa onto it and blown everyone's mind. Like, you're like you know what I mean? I would, but, uh, I would love to continue to see this story of... Because we've always we've always taken for granted, even from the original trilogy, you know, the Rebel Alliance. That's just something. What does that mean? The Rebel Alliance. Yeah. Just this group. Right. Well, no, it means an alliance is something that's created and forged between separate entities. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, like maybe what we see next season, because with the year gaps where I think we're going to see the Mount Calamari join, we're yes. going to see we're going to see other groups join this cause. To the point where we are where we are in in Rogue One, where they're actually that's going I, after the plans. That's what I would love to see in season two is the formation of the Rebel Alliance. Uh, because they kind of name drop these different sects of groups throughout the galaxy throughout this season. Like Luthen kind of name dropped a few. Um, you know, there's there's they're separate now. And to see them form up together and solidify into one cohesive unit next season, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, that I agree with, and I kind I want to see Jen Erso. Yeah, if we're gonna get more of um, of Saul Guerrero, 
we need to see Jen Erso because if this yeah. movie, if this show is leading into that movie, Rogue One, and we're leaning into uh, Andor, she's a main character in that movie as well. Right. And I want to see so, KSO. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, there's no doubt in my mind we're getting KSO in season two. No, yeah. no doubt in my mind we're getting K2, uh, K2SO. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I like the show as a whole. I enjoyed the show. It was, like you said, it was a complete different pace of a show. Uh, like I said, my biggest gripe of the show is it's misnamed. It was less about Andor and more about everything else going on around. There's so many secular characters that were taking the spotlight away from the namesake of the show. Right. But, I mean, that's a, that's a very minor, minor gripe. And I still want to know, is there anything to Luthen? Is there more to right. Luthen that we really know about that they've given? Are, were they dropping hints in his shop when he handed over that, I believe, is a lightsaber? Right. Is is there more to him that that we know? Like I, I still think the idea that I came up with the last show about his ending being with Vader would be a cool ending. Yes. And like Vader finds out he is a force sensitive, he is an ex Jedi that was able to cloak himself and was able to not be found. He, he took on a different persona. And Vader found out. And and it's not an inquisitor that comes after him it's vader himself um that's funny because it's like they've already kind of claimed their stake that season two is kind of going to be it with the announcement that that's the story be is it going to be skipping all the way uh you know the formation every three episodes is skip a year leading all the way up to the beginning of rogue one they've already kind of set that they've announced that right so it's like they only have one season to wrap up a ton of things uh, give us some interesting backstory on some of the characters we've been introduced to, like Luthen. Um, if that's possible, that's something that I feel Could we like. See a spinoff. Oh yeah, I forgot where I'm at. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so could we if, see a spinoff of Luthen? Um, uh, what's another thing that needs to uh, the formation of the Rebel Alliance? Seeing that story take place, um, and then just like giving some sort of satisfying ending to the folks that we don't see in Rogue One, like Luthen. So it's like a backstory and an, an end story, I guess you, you would say. Um, but uh, that's a lot to do in one season of television. I hope uh, Could they, they can do give it. us an ending similar to Rogue One in Andor. Where there where, like, is a bunch a, of people are taken out. Where there's a satisfying ending to all these characters that we know we don't see going forward. Oh, I don't know. Um, like we don't we see uh Saul Guerrero going forward. We see Andor, we see Ma Mothma, but frankly, they're the only characters in this show that we know going forward. Oh, there's one yeah, other one. He's true. a part of Rogue One, but he's the one that does the prison break. Oh, uh, Melshi, yeah, yeah. yeah he's so, right. could we see some type of, you know, Rogue One just destruction take place in, a, in like a in a battle that they're all wiped off? You know the galaxy um, maybe and i think thematically that would fit with the the tone of rogue one you know what i mean that feels right you know what i mean like uh like dedra and uh bix and like um um you know basically the crew that that andor saves on ferrix he fills up that ship and tells them to get out of there yeah. right that that small crew um we could see the end of them and the end of dedra and yeah that that's possible i feel like that fits with the uh, the tone but it would have to be satisfying the right, end of right, Rogue right. One was very satisfying. Yeah, like they got their objective done, and then it had, you know, the what the, the Death Star took a shot. Yeah, right. And the wave was coming, you know, all deep impact style. Right. And it, it was just it, it felt like a very satisfying ending, and that's why I think I liked that movie as much as I did. Yeah. There's outside of the very ending where they trans they got the actual Death Star plans out. And then Vader on the ship and everything and Leia. That was a very good ending. Ending to a movie. Star Wars movies don't have endings. Yeah. That was pretty much an ending of that whole story. Until and, they did the, the Andor show. And the way that Rogue One wraps up and delves so neatly and tightly into the opening of A New Hope. Where it's yeah. just like, I mean, that opening shot of A New Hope and Vader coming aboard the Tantive Four and leia and stuff like that's that's how star wars was introduced to everyone <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean that's 77 star wars like 
and to take it back to that, it was very satisfying. But uh, yeah, overall, Andor completely enjoyable. Um, I'm looking forward to a season two. I thought the acting was great. I thought they took a big swing to give it the tone that it had. And uh, yeah, I, I liked it quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm all for you. I'm all with you. I'm ready for season two. I don't know how long it's going to take us to get season two. Hopefully, we don't have to wait two years. Like we have to wait for that. everything else that we've been, we've been covering. That sucks. Yeah. Now you were just saying earlier in this show they should maybe just stop doing Star Wars That's, for a bit. Well, well, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> but this, with it being the series, it is. I don't want to wait a long period of time. Right, new right. series and new movies. I was kind of re- mentioning that towards. To be fair, come on. <laughs> but uh, what did you guys think? Did you guys enjoy it? Well, we both enjoyed it as a different type of Star Wars. This isn't your, you know, your your kids Star Wars lightsabers, force battles, you know, Yoda doing flips all over the place, uh, type Star Wars. But uh, drop us a comment. Let us know. Uh, we are live. If anyone's watching, is anyone watching? Uh, <laughs> uh, drop a comment live here. But uh, I mean, that's pretty much what we got this week. I mean, we're going to be doing, we already handed towards uh, picking up a uh, Willow next weekend. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a new one. I'm new, completely new to the franchise. I knew nothing of the original. Well, it was a movie, correct? If I It was a movie. It was from the 80s. Yeah, I've, I've never seen it. So I, I definitely, I kind of want to watch the movie before I jump into this. I don't. Again. I think I'm gonna, I want to go in cold. Okay, interesting. Okay, I'll watch the movie then. So we'll have different perspectives there. There we go. That's that's a good idea. Uh, but I mean, I think for this week, we've talked a lot. A lot more than we uh, anticipated actually talking about. But uh, yeah. it's a lot of the, the earlier stuff. But I guess until we see you next week. See you after the show. Thank <laughs> you.